Hi, I'm Sarah Wise, and I'm an assistant professor in the biology department. Well, classroom-based assessment for me is all about making uh, it clear whether or not students have achieved uh, the learning objectives that I've set for them. So uh, this, for me, takes place in, in two contexts. One is in the classroom, um, and that is more uh, summative assessment, uh, which is focused on me gauging student progress towards the objectives. So this might look like me asking questions in class. It might look like... Um, me using a clicker system, which is something that I use a lot in the classroom, um, to ask a question of the students and check in with their understanding. How are they doing uh, with a particular content uh, area or topic? Um, I'll ask them a question, and then by them being able to click in with their clicker, I can very easily get a distribution of the class and see uh, how well they're tracking in terms of their understanding. If most of the students are converging on the correct answer, um, then I am, am getting uh, insight into the fact that they're actually understanding the content. If their answers are dispersed across the board and they're, they're widespread um, and they're maybe not converging on the answer I would have predicted, then I give them an opportunity to talk with someone sitting around them. Um, often I'll use cooperative groups in this context and they'll have a chance to talk through their thinking and then after a few minutes I'll give them an opportunity to click back in. And at that point I can see how the impact of the conversation influenced their thinking um, and then we, we still might have to unpack that a little bit more as a class um, as I ask them to explain why they chose their answer, which really gets at my um, understanding of where they're at in their thinking. So it helps me to understand them um, and their progress on the objectives. Um, the other aspect of assessment um, that I use is the, the more formal assessments, the things we would call a, a test or a quiz or a lab report, uh, to give me an understanding of student performance on these objectives. Um, so I will look at um, their performance in terms of their score. I might look at, uh, if it's an oral presentation, their uh, fluidity using biology terminology, uh, things that... Um, kind of give me an opportunity to collect data about how well students are achieving their objectives. Well, I've mentioned objectives a couple of times, and the reason that I am mentioning them is because objectives are essential for designing assessments. Uh, in order to have an assessment at all, I need to know what I'm going to assess, and that is where the objective comes in. So if I don't have clearly stated and measurable objectives, uh, then I don't have any reason to assess. Uh, so for me, I have to, have to start with those objectives uh, and get them clearly stated in a fashion that's measurable um, in a way that I can actually determine whether or not a student is making progress to those objectives. So saying something like, the student will understand how the body works, well, that's really hard to assess. And so I try to refine uh, that thinking and say, well, what is it that I really want a student to know and be able to do? Um, and once I can articulate that and say, well, I really want them to, you know, name the major muscle groups, or I really want them to um, explain how digestion of a protein uh, from a chicken sandwich works, um, then I have something that I can measure as an outcome. Well, Bloom's Taxonomy uh, is a framework that was developed in the 1950s by Bloom, uh, Benjamin Bloom and his colleagues, and they designed this as a way for test writers to communicate in a similar language about the kinds of assessment questions uh, that they're asking um, on their assessments. Bloom's taxonomy is illustrated here, and what you can see in this is that um, it's a nested hierarchy. Uh, so there's a series of six levels um, of cognitive complexity. Starting at the bottom are uh, tasks that are easier for the brain to do. Things like uh, listing, naming, describing, or identifying are what Bloom would classify as a lower level cognitive skill. Um, as you progress up uh, the hierarchy, you increasingly uh, become more cognitively challenging for the students. So asking a student to evaluate something or interpret something 
or to generate a hypothesis is a much more cognitively challenging task for the student than it is for them to list, describe, or uh, identify something. What's unique about this hierarchy is that it's nested. So if you were to ask a student to analyze something, uh, in order for them to be able to do that analysis, they need to have the knowledge, they need to be able to comprehend how that uh, piece of information works, they need to be able to apply it in a situation, uh, all of those things need to be done in order to do the analysis. Likewise, if you were to ask them to evaluate something, they'd have to do uh, the synthesizing of the content material, they'd have to analyze the content material, they'd have to apply it, comprehend it, and know it. So it becomes uh, fairly easy to assess um, a lower level cognitive skills embedded within a higher level uh, cognitive process. So I will use Bloom's uh, to give me an idea of uh, when I construct my learning objective, what level of cognitive processing am I asking my students to achieve? Am I asking them to name the parts of uh, the skeletal system? Am I asking them to describe how ions move across a membrane? Or am I asking them to analyze a graph or hypothesize uh, what um, you could test given these uh, conditions? When I can identify what cognitive level I am targeting with my assessment, then it becomes easier for me to determine um, what I should ask my students to do in an assessment so that I can check whether or not they've achieved those learning objectives. Another way that I use uh, Bloom's taxonomy is actually with my students. Um, I give my students my learning objectives at the very beginning of every class period that uh, we have together, and I tell them that those are their study guide for the semester. Um, but what I realize is that they need help interpreting those learning objectives so that they can learn um, and show their mastery of those learning objectives. So one thing that I give to them uh, is this table, um, which has the Bloom's level, um, which you saw earlier in that hierarchy, uh, along with a description of what I might be asking the student to do at each of those levels. So for the application level three, the question is, can I use this information? Then I give them a column of verbs, um, and these verbs uh, are triggers for them. When they see them in a learning objective, they can map that learning objective to a Bloom's level. So in that same um, application example, I might give them uh, a calculation-based question. And if they see the word calculate in their learning objective, they know that I'm going to ask them to use that information, not to recall that information. Uh, so they can use the verbs as a study tool to help them understand what kinds of questions I might be asking on my assessments uh, that check their uh, progress towards these learning objectives. So when I am designing a course, the first thing I need to do is establish my course learning objectives. And these are the big, broad outcomes that I want students to achieve by the time they finish the course. So I ask myself, you know, what knowledge, what skills, and what abilities do I want students to have when they're done taking their 100 level biology course? And to do that, I go to a couple of different sources. Uh, one. Uh, my, my primary source is the instructors who are teaching the 200 level courses. They're going to get my students next, and so my question is, what do they want uh, in their incoming students? Uh, and that really will frame um, kind of the outcomes of the, the course that comes before, um, which is my course. Uh, so that's one place that I go. Uh, the other place I go is to the, the course textbook. Um, you know, with biology, uh, we have our big introductory biology text, and there's lots of information in there, but you know, what is the sections or what are the sections that are, are designated for the course that I'm teaching? And then within those sections, you know, what are the key essentials, the things that students have to have um, that I would be uh, not doing my job if they walked out of the class not knowing? Um, and then from there, I also talk with colleagues who have taught the course before or who are teaching a similar course at other institutions, asking them what are the big key take-homes uh, from their courses 
And when I put all of that information together, I can usually generate you know, three, three to five big course semester long learning objectives uh, that I will use to frame the context of my course. Um, so after I have those set, that gives me a vision of where I'm going um, and where I'm aiming with my students. And then to help my students get to those aims, I need to look at what's happening every day in my classroom. And that's developing uh, daily learning objectives. And those learning objectives um, are designed to help students progress towards the end of the semester. And so when I sit down and I look at those end of the semester goals, I look at how I can schedule and work each day uh, to help students meet those objectives. Um, and so I will often think about um, an end of the course objective and then work backwards to think what are the steps in between that students need to have and how can I put those into my schedule and establish those daily learning objectives that will help students progress to the course level objectives. Forwards design um, should actually be called forwards design, I think, because it's what I do as a scientist every single day. Um, if I'm going to walk into the lab, I always establish my goals or my aims first. Then I figure out what kind of data I need to collect in order to figure out whether or not the phenomenon I'm observing or testing actually is behaving in the way that I'm thinking it is. Um, and then I figure out a method, and I, and I go about and I execute my research. The exact same parallel is drawn in the classroom um, when I'm thinking about how to design a course and how to derive and write assessments. The very first thing that I go to are my learning objectives, uh, and those I create based on the large course goals and then individualized class meetings uh, have goals that lead me to the end aim of the course, to those large course objectives. Um, when I start developing my objectives, um, Bloom's Taxonomy comes in uh, very helpful to me in developing that process. Um, and I'm going to establish those learning objectives um, and link them to a Bloom's level. Uh, I actually term it blooming my objectives because I'm going to go through each one and assign it. Is this a level two? Is this a level three? Is this a level one? Is this a level six? And once I know that, uh, then I can uh, target uh, the next step in the backwards design process, which is designing the assessments. So I clearly state what my learning objectives are for my students. I assign them a Bloom's level. And then I need to think about what kinds of data I could collect from my students that would give me insight into whether or not they've achieved those objectives. So I start writing every assessment that I do with a list of the objectives right in front of me. I'm asking my students to make a model of the digestive system then I'm going to assess them at a similar level um, and on similar content in my assessment. Making a model falls under level five of Bloom's, which is a synthesis question. It makes them pull together all of these pieces and integrate it into a whole. And so what I would then do on the assessment is think about a level five assessment question that I could ask them about the digestive system. Uh, maybe it's contextualized. Maybe it's actually uh, asking them to digest a piece of pizza and model how that pizza moves through their digestive system. Uh, but in doing that, I am making sure that the types of data I'm gathering from my assessment are going to give me insight into the objectives that I have asked my students to achieve. So I'm looking for alignment there. I will try to match on the content um, and also on the Bloom's level of the assessment and the objective that I um, am trying to um, determine student understanding uh, from. And then the third piece of backwards design is classroom instruction. Uh, so I've established my course objectives. I've figured out how I'm going to assess them. You know, not just that I'm going to give them exam number one, exam number two, and exam number three, but I actually know what's in all of those assessments before I even start thinking about the rest of my course. Um, and once I know what I'm assessing, I know where I need to get my students. 
So then I take each unit um, of instruction and try to figure out my method, just like I would do in the lab. Once I've established my hypotheses, once I've figured out the types of data that I need or the statistical analysis that I'm going to do, uh, then I think about what method I'm going to use. And there's a variety of different methods out there for getting your students towards those learning objectives. And, and that's where we have the ability to be flexible and creative in how we do that. Uh, but once we have those objectives set up and we know how we're going to assess our students, uh, then that really drives uh, the actual classroom pedagogy that we implement uh, to try and push our students towards achieving those learning objectives. They can get up and leave 
uh, and walk away from that stimulus in many cases or run away from that stimulus if they need to. But since plants are rooted into the ground, their sensory response systems are actually quite fantastic because they can't move in the face of danger in their environment. So I would like you to start off brainstorming a list of plant stimulus. So what are different things in the plant's environment that they need to be aware of and possibly respond to? signals back to their brain, mm -hmm. and I feel like this is what's happening um, in step two. It's transducing, uh, transducing the signal, and it's communicating to uh, the rest of the cells. I feel like I feel like it's going back to the nucleus. So that's why I picked D. Okay. 
So the rationale there for the action potential was the action potential takes the external stimulus and moves it all the way into the central nervous system. And in our case here, step two is to transduce the signal from the outside of the environment to the inside of the nucleus. And so as a result of that, we are transferring the signal. We're not necessarily using an action potential to do that, but it's the same analogy here in the plant model that we're taking a stimulus from the outside and we're bringing it to the portion of the organism that's going to initiate some sort of response. Okay, so take one minute and, uh, or four minutes, I guess, one minute apiece to summarize each of these steps so far in the lab. So, the external or internal signal activates the receptors and then it transduces the signal, which then communicates the signal to the rest of the cell. And then it can either directly or Okay, so we're going to compare and contrast our plant and animal stimulus responses now. Uh, there are things that are unique to the plant, there are things that are unique to the animal, and then there are things that go in the center that both plants and animals do. So I'd ask you to work through this Venn diagram in your groups and then we'll report out what are the similarities, what are the differences between plant and animals and their response to stimulus in their environment. We will start out with uh, the coffee lovers. You can choose if you want to give it a similarity or a difference on either side. Just uh, start us off. Well, one of the first strategies that you saw in the classroom uh, was a review sequence of clicker questions. Um, I use those for a variety of reasons. Um, one is I'm, I'm checking in with student knowledge on the concepts. Uh, basic low-level blooms, uh, knowledge and comprehension level one and level two, um, I can really easily assess through a series of clicker questions. Um, they are derived from the class meeting that we had beforehand, and it's my way to check in and say, okay, are they following with the content? Uh, where are they in their understanding? And are there any kind of areas that are cloudy or gray that we need to go back and revisit? And you saw that during the example that sometimes the students converge right away on the right answer. And in that, those cases, that gave me a clear indication that they knew what was going on, they were comfortable with the material, and they were ready to, to move in a different direction. And then there were other cases where the class was split, um, maybe between two answers or maybe between two or three answers. Um, and in those instances, I knew that we needed to spend a little bit more time uh, revisiting those concepts. So what I asked the students to do at that point was to talk with their group members. And then when they do that, they had an opportunity to hear someone else's explanation, they had an opportunity to ask questions, and they had a chance to look back at their notes. Um, and all of those things then were able to help them uh, come to a more concrete answer. Um, and as they did that, I was moving around the classroom uh, and listening into their conversations. And, and also, when I walk by them, they're more likely to ask me a question. And so the student groups would stop me and say, hey, this doesn't make sense. Um, and that gave me a great opportunity to work with uh, students, um, even in a large class setting, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. After they had some time to talk, I would ask them to re-click in their responses.
And in doing that, then you could really see a shift in student responses, uh, mostly to converging on the right answer. Sometimes it happens where they converge on the wrong answer, and, and we can unpack that as well. Um, but I like then, once the majority of the class has converged on the right answer, um, I just call out on a group, and you saw me do that, and ask for a person to respond from group A uh, that is going to uh, tell me the, the reason why they chose that answer. So not that they just saw the highest bar was option choice D um, when they looked at the clicker graph, but they could really under or explain their understanding of why that was the right answer. So that was kind of the first uh, review that I do at the beginning of class. Just helpful for me to make sure that they're processing and helping to get the students engaged. Um, the feedback is they really like taking those few minutes at the beginning of class to review uh, the prior course material. Um, after that, I give them the learning objectives so that they have a roadmap of where we're going and they know what kinds of things they'll be doing during class based on the Bloom's level of those uh, learning objectives. And I had uh, four that I gave them uh, that spanned all the way from Bloom's level one to Bloom's level five uh, that we would be um, going through during the course of that class. Um, then I like to assess their incoming knowledge. And what I asked them to do was uh, brainstorm a list of uh, stimulus in a plant's environment that the plant might need to respond to. I have an understanding of where they're coming from just based on prior content that we've um, gone through during class and the responses that students have given throughout that um, class discussion. But what I don't know very well is what they're coming into the classroom with. What other knowledge and plans do they have? What is their background in that? Um, and so I just ask them in their groups to put their heads together and, and generate a list for me of stimulus that they've heard of that plants respond to. Um, and then they all know that the protocol in our classroom is that um, each group is going to be called on and that a particular person is going to need to respond um, from that group. And that's one way that I um, encourage accountability within um, these discussion times. I don't just allow them to talk and then don't follow up on that. Um, that way they know that um, yeah, I am going to call on them, and it might be their time to talk, and they need to be ready and accountable for the material that they have just um, discussed. So then we make a list on the board, and you saw that um, using uh, the strategy in the classroom, and that tells me right away, okay, yep, these guys have a really great understanding of different types of environmental stimulus um, that the, the plants are going to need to respond to, and that then we can progress um, from there. Um, the next thing that you saw was a short lecture uh, clip in the uh, video. Um, I did a, about a 10-minute uh, lecture portion on uh, the, the main bulk of the content from the day, and then following and interspersed within that lecture were a few checks for understanding with the clickers again. Um, and those were, again, just assessing basic uh, level one and level two blooms, but getting um, information for me rapidly on the spot. Are the students tracking with this material? Is the pace okay? Are they answering in a way that their body language and other uh, head nods and questions in class is indicating to me that they're, they're actually um, on track with this information. Um, and then uh, after those clicker questions, um, the thing that I have, ins have tried this semester with uh, this particular group of students that you saw is a four-minute summary. Uh, so at the end of, of each little mini lecture segment, or even at the end of the whole class, um, I'll have a slide that is a four-minute summary. And uh, what that does is articulate for each person in the group uh, what they need to summarize to the rest of their group. So person number one might need uh, to summarize what some of the environmental stimuli were and how that basic response pattern would work. Um, others in the group would have a different task, and each person would take about a minute to summarize summarize that um, within their small groups. Um, and then as they do that, again, I'm walking around um, and I'm asking and listening into their conversations to see if they have any questions and kind of where uh, they might need help in that context. Um, and then depending on the class, depending on how things have gone so far, I may ask each group to actually summarize uh, their part to the whole class. So I might call out on group number two and ask them to say, okay, well, person number two, would you summarize that to the class? Just as another way of reviewing. And if I do that, often another group, person number two, will jump in and say, oh, but you forgot about this, or this is also important. And that is a, a really solid group 
review um, and also helps me to see what they're taking away from lecture. What do they think is important after we've had this uh, little snippet of, of content? Not necessarily what I think is important, but hearing it from them and what they're taking away from it um, is really insightful for me. Um, then I asked them uh, to compare and contrast uh, the knowledge that they had now about plants to the knowledge that we had done earlier about animals. Uh, we were working on the nervous response systems in animals and comparing that to the sensory responses in plants. So I asked them to make a Venn diagram um, to compare and contrast those two um, models that we had been working with. And I asked them to write that down um, as they're working in groups. And I did that for a couple of reasons. It helps them uh, to have something concrete in their notes to go back to. Um, and I also like to have a visual on their paper when I walk by their groups because I can very easily then see what they're thinking and, and where they're going um, with the knowledge that they're putting together. So that was another strategy that you saw. Um, in the video and uh, what you didn't get to see in the video was what I did in the the following class which was um, addressing the final learning objective which was to make a model of plant response to the stimulus so we came back and um, had a few review clicker questions uh, finished up a couple of things related to plant stimulus responses and then uh, the, the kind of culmination of that unit of instruction was uh, a more formal assessment um, in the context of making this uh, model that shows how a plant responds to something like gravity or uh, to sunlight and um, the students worked together in their groups to do that uh, to construct this model um, and when they were done with that um, they turned those in to me um, so that I could take a, a detailed look at their understanding in a uh, more synthesis way um, and then we share those models uh, either using like a visualizer or an Elmo where you can actually put student work up onto the the screen um, or I'll also have them if it's a smaller model just draw it up on the board and ask them to verbally explain uh, what's going on in their model as well and so that's an assessment strategy that wasn't featured in the video but um, went along with the sequence that you actually saw. So traditional assessments are things that uh, most of us do all the time. They're quizzes, they're exams, uh, they're homework assignments, or in some cases uh, I might even call a lab report a traditional assessment in science um, because that's something that we do very regularly. Um, traditional assessments are really designed to give you uh, an end of an instructional unit kind of um, progress on student objectives. So how did they do after working to achieve all of these daily learning objectives for the past three weeks? How are they doing overall? It's uh, more of a uh, summative type of assessment at this point, um, looking at how they did over a span of time. Um, and what is on that assessment really depends on your learning objectives. Uh, most of the time, traditional quizzes that are multiple choice um, and true-false or matching uh, tend to assess lower level Bloom's uh, cognitive processes. Levels one and two are very, very easy to assess um, in those uh, kind of traditional formats. Uh, you can assess level three, you can assess level four, five, and six in a uh, more traditional assessment as well. Um, but it's, it takes more involvement and more thought on the behalf of the instructor uh, to actually construct um, a question that, um, especially in a multiple choice format, that's really going to get students to analyze or synthesize something. Um, so I use traditional assessments uh, in a couple of different ways. I do use quizzes. I do use exams um, within the context of the course. I also use homework assignments as well. Um, and all of those... Um, are designed to meet certain objectives to show to give students an opportunity to demonstrate um, whether or not they can achieve the objective and so the design of them uh, follows that backwards design principle you know what is the learning objective and then what kind of a question can I ask to get data that shows me whether or not students have met that objective um, and that can be done through the quiz through the exam through the homework assignment uh, through a, a lab report or a project of some sort 
The other type of assessment that can be uh, used is a performance-based assessment. Um, and again, what you assess with a performance assessment really depends on your, your stated learning objectives. A performance assessment can be used to assess a low-level Bloom's question. You can sit down and have an oral exam with a student, uh, which is performance-based. It's, it's them not necessarily writing a response, but actually communicating um, in a way to you. But you could still be checking for basic knowledge and basic comprehension. Um, within that context. Uh, you could also assess all the way up to a level five or a level six, and, and typically a performance assessment uh, does better with these higher level cognitive processing skills because it gives students an ability to uh, really analyze or really evaluate uh, something and, and construct a um, response and put the pieces together. So things that might fall into this category would be uh, constructing a model, um, doing a large uh, review project, uh, looking looking at, uh, say, an argument in a scientific paper and uh, kind of pulling that argument apart and seeing if it's valid. That would be an evaluation kind of a uh, question or evaluating a claim. Um, you could also look at a, a lab report or a lab practical um, as a demonstration of skills that would be performance-based um, in science to, to actually try and get at student performance um, in that particular context. Uh, so the creation of a performance assessment, again, goes back to the learning objective. If my learning objective for my student is to analyze some data, uh, then their performance assessment is actually going to be uh, given the student given a data set and ask them to maybe run statistical tests on those data um, and then uh, make a conclusion, uh, kind of interpret those that, that data set and, uh, and use that information to construct a response. Um, that response could be shared in a variety of different ways. It could be a written uh, response. Um, I've also used what's called a data blitz as a way for students to demonstrate their understanding of uh, an analysis level question where they have a data set. Uh, sometimes it's a data set that they've actually collected on their own and had to make sense of, but then they, pr they prepare one slide with just their data and they put it up uh, and they have about a, a two minute time slot where they walk through what they did to their data to get the results and then they share what their results mean. And that's a real fast way to go through the class and check in with uh, student processing of a higher level uh, content um, or cognitive processing level. Uh, so that's one example um, of something that uh, I've used in the context of the class. Um, I also use models a lot. That's something that I found, especially in ecology, really helps students to put things together. It forces them to uh, come up with what are the relevant components in this system and how do those components fit together. And the language that a student uses uh, to connect one structure to another structure within the context of a model gives me insight into their processing. If they use the word photosynthesis and they can and explain what that means when linking the sun to the plant, uh, that is uh, giving me an indication that they're processing and starting to use some of the vocabulary of the field. If they're using the sun and plants and connecting it by absorbed, well then I get a whole nother um, level of insight into what students are processing. And so asking them to create something um, that is completely independent and asking them to pull a lot of the content together and, and create something new gives me a lot of insight um, into their thinking and oftentimes a lot more than them just uh, choosing a correct answer uh, from a multiple cho uh, choice kind of context. So that's um, one of the reasons I might use a performance assessment. Well, one of the things that makes uh, using some non-traditional assessment challenging is that um, the grading of them. Uh, when you have a multiple choice exam or a multiple choice quiz, A is A and B is B, and it's pretty easy to grade um, in terms of time and in terms of uh, clarity for the student. Uh, but it becomes more challenging when you're using an assessment that does not give a clear cut this is A, this is B, this is C. And that can be frustrating for you and it can also be frustrating for the student. Um, and one way that um, I go about uh, a kind of grading the assessments that I use that are more non-traditional um, is by using rubrics. And rubrics are a way to quantify uh, 
the vast array of responses that you're going to get from your students when you give them an open-ended option or you give them uh, a question that allows them to really explain what they know or model what they know. Um, and rubrics are um, all about the product that the student creates. They're not about the student themselves, and that's one thing um, that often gets tangled in uh, the making of a rubric. It says the student will, um, and that can be very hurtful for the student if they get that back and say, oh, the student is not proficient, or the student is weak, or the student is emerging. Um, that can be uh, challenging for them. So if you keep the focus on the product, say the lab report, you know, did this or the presentation showed, um, that makes it a little bit easier for the student to process that information. And so when you're writing a rubric, I'm always mindful of um, the fact that I'm focusing on the product and not on the student. Um, the other thing that I look at when I'm writing a rubric for the first time um, is taking all the student work in front of me and the first cut that I make is those that are in kind of the upper end and those that are in the lower end um, and that's usually a pretty easy division to make. Then it becomes harder to tease apart you know kind of what makes this pile of students over here exemplary and what uh, the ones in the middle uh, how they are different from the ones that are just below the middle um, and the ones on the other end are pretty easy to sort out too. The, the polar ends are pretty easy, but those middle two categories, if you're going with four categories in your, your rubric, um, are a lot harder to tease apart. And that's where uh, taking a look at student work before you actually, uh, you know, give that assignment uh, to another group of students can be really helpful in actually defining uh, the categories for your rubric ways to use rubrics in the classroom, um, but the first and most important way is actually to get it in the hands of the students, um, especially if you're assigning some sort of a project or um, anything that's actually going to be graded using a rubric, the students should have right when you give them the assignment. Um, and so I actually staple mine right accompanied to the project description so they have it uh, when they get the project. They know how they're going to be evaluated. Um, a couple of things that I like to do with that is initially, um, especially if this is the second time they're getting a rubric, say they've already done one lab report, now they're getting a second rubric for a second lab report, I actually like them to sit down and look through that rubric and say what's similar compared to the first project that we did and what's different compared to the second project that we're doing now and highlighting a few of those things. Um, as we move along in the semester, the rubrics get more detailed, they get more specific because the expectation of the student is getting higher. Um, and so sometimes there's word limits being placed in there, sometimes there's uh, information on the number of graphs that need to go into their final paper, and so I want them to be aware of some of those changes. Um, after the, the student or while the student is working on the project, I encourage them to use that rubric uh, step by step. When they're writing the methods, have that rubric right next to them uh, so that they know uh, what category they want to be in. Have them target, do they want to be proficient, do they want to be excellent, and then try to write using that rubric as they go. Um, and then when they're finally done, I ask them in their groups to use the rubric to evaluate theirs, to circle right on the rubric. Where do they think they fell um, in these categories after their final product is done? And I encourage them to do that three or four days before the paper is due. Now, that doesn't always happen, but those that do then look at it and say, ooh, you know, we fell here, and now we have a chance to make some improvements before we actually turn in um, our final copy um, in class. Um, the other thing I've done is uh, have students bring a draft of their paper into the classroom and swap it with another group and let another group use the rubric on their paper as a way to get some peer feedback and also to get practice using the rubric. Uh, students do need practice using these things. Um, they may have seen them before, they may or may not have used them or known how to use them, so part of my responsibility, I feel, is to help them learn how to use these tools that we're giving to them to help them be successful. And when they do know how to use those tools, uh, the quality of work that the student actually produces at the end is much greater um, because you're seeing a student who says, okay, these are the expectations and I'm going to make sure that I meet these expectations. Um, and I did. I can see that in my work. And that self-evaluation, that self-reflection of here's the standard, here's how I'm doing compared to that standard is invaluable, um, I think, in, in terms of student progress and also a lifelong skill, giving students an ability to say, okay, here's where I want to be and here's where I am, how can I take steps to get there, or here's where I am and, and, and here's the standard, oh, we're pretty close and I feel pretty good about that. Um, and so I actually like to use that a lot um, in the context of, of rubrics in the classroom.
Sometimes they may be accompanied with a checklist just so students make sure that they turn in everything that they need. That's not always the case because sometimes um, the rubric is detailed enough that we actually don't need a separate checklist to accompany it. But that might be one other thing. Um, if you if there are lots of loose ends, you know, students need an abstract, students need a draft, students need uh, a list of references, students need to staple the articles that they, you know, read for their paper to the back, you know, whatever it might be, having a checklist just helps to make sure that there's nothing uh, left behind on the student's end um, when they turn something in. There's no, oops, I forgot that, if they can actually walk down that list and check it off. So that helps me in grading too, because uh, then there's less uh, missing pieces to a project and I have everything there at once to grade. groups a lot in my classes and one of the reasons that I use them is that actually models the practice of science. Science is not done as one individual in a lab by his, his or herself and so I like to get my students used to collaborating with one another um, but that requires a lot of work up front to kind of encourage both group accountability and individual accountability and those are things that we start off with right at the beginning of the semester when students form, form groups. Uh, one of the things I ask them to do first First, right away is to make a group contract about how they're going to function together and, and what their group role is and then to follow up with that individual piece each individual person needs to say how they are going to contribute and uh, kind of what their role is so we start off very simple low stress kind of a task but it gives them the idea that they're going to be accountable as a group and as an individual and then as we go through the course um, I kind of scaffold um, their use of the groups and their accountability. At the beginning of the semester I want them to get comfortable talking with each other and so a lot of times I'll ask them to talk to their group and then when I call out on a group during uh, our class session I don't really care who responds during from that group. I just want to hear from someone and I'll just say please someone in the group tell me what your group was thinking. So then I'll hear from one person. And over about a course of three weeks, we'll rotate through the groups many times, hearing from them. And typically what I notice at that point is one or two people are comfortable responding for the group. So I know that one or two people are vocal and able to share their understanding. But now I'm at the point where I'm ready uh, to push the groups a little bit further. And at that point, uh, each person in the group assumes a number or a color or a letter. Um, and what I have done, um, I've taken two different approaches. One is I'll put a letter um, if I have person A, B, C, and D within a group, I'll put that letter up on the board when I get into the classroom. And they know that day, whichever group I call on, person B is going to be the one who has to talk today. Um, and then this semester I'm trying something a little bit different. I have assigned uh, all the groups uh, A, B, C, and D, and then I'll ask them to, to float through that order on their own. So the first time I call on uh, one of the groups, person A is going to respond. And the next time I call on that same group, person B is going to respond. That actually is working better in a small class um, because uh, of the, the quickness with which I rotate through calling on the groups that I have in my classroom. Um, and so that then forces that person to be ready to respond uh, to a particular question. And they know that they're going to be accountable for it. Um, I've had some instances when I taught larger classes um, where I'd actually put the group that's going to be responsible for reporting on my slide. If I gave them a question that they were going to discuss, I would say, you know, this group, uh, the name of that group, the Fantastic Four or something, then they're going to be responsible for sharing that piece of information. I've moved away from that a little bit because it kind of puts the other groups off uh, off the hook and their um, intensity of their conversations tends to decrease a little bit because they know they're not going to be called on. But if you keep that surprise element of everyone is accountable and it could be your group, uh, then you keep them uh, engaged in that conversation. So those are the more informal ways that I assess the groups um, and have both group accountability and individual accountability. Um, in terms of a more formal way that I do this, um, anytime they're involved in a large project together that has high stakes, there's a group component to that grade and an individual component, a participation component. Uh, the group component of the grade is, you know, whatever they submit together as a final product, that, that grade is going to be dispersed among the people within the group. Uh, I can see from their work in lab and their work in class who's really pulling the group and who's maybe lagging behind within that group. 
Um, so I have a, an idea of what's going on in those groups, but I actually like to get feedback from the students about that as well. Uh, so I give them what's called a group effort um, analysis form. And the students each get one of these. It's a homework assignment, so it's not done sitting right next to their group members. And I ask them to rate themselves and their group members um, in both a qualitative way, uh, what, what kind of work did they do, and a quantitative way, how much of the work did they do, or what percentage of effort did they put in. Then I take all of those sheets, and pretty quickly a pattern can emerge if you look at all four people in the group um, and their responses all together. And a lot of times that matches up with what I've been seeing in class, and in some cases it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then um, I'll often sit down with the group and kind of talk through, you know, what's going on in terms of group dynamics and how did they work together on this project if there's a, a large discrepancy in their responses. Uh, and then those points um, are what I will assign. I don't have the students grade each other. They're just giving me feedback on how uh, they're working together. And then that goes into the individual component of the grade. Uh, the other thing I do um, with, say, a large lab report that students are writing is each person in the group needs to be accountable for everything in that paper. So if their name is on the front, I should be able to walk up to them and ask them to explain how they did the statistics or why they use this source in the discussion. Um, and I found that when I do that, when I actually follow up with that, when I walk up to a student and say, hey, can you explain to me how you got these data? Uh, then they know they have to be accountable for it. Then even if they do the divide and conquer approach, someone does the intro, someone does the methods, they, they understand that they're going to be accountable for that. And so uh, I may do that on an assessment. I may put a question on the assessment that says explain how you did your data analysis uh, in your paper. Um, and then each person has to do that completely on uh, his or her own. Um, and that's one way that I, I really keep up the individual accountability. And, and they know it's not just a blanket statement. You, you might be accountable for this. When I actually follow up on that early in the semester, I set the stage for, uh, for following up on that throughout the semester, and then they know that they're going to be accountable for uh, the material as well, not just as, as a member of the group, but as an individual. Well, validity is one of those terms that you hear thrown around a lot with assessment. Um, but validity is is really all about um, if I know that my objective says X, does my assessment actually assess that objective? Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can do that um, to make sure that uh, your objectives are aligned with your assessment. Uh, Webb's alignment criteria is one of those that's uh, widely used in large-scale assessment. But for me, on a practical basis, uh, when I'm in my classroom, I do a real quick check for content uh, val uh, validity. So what I do with that is look at my objective, and I first identify the content that it's on. So what is it that I'm assessing my students on? Is it photosynthesis? Is it respiration? Uh, you know, what is that broad uh, concept that I'm looking at? Then from there, I determine the Bloom's level. So what level of cognitive process am I asking my students to achieve to in uh, that particular uh, learning objective? When I go to write my assessment then, I'm trying to make sure that uh, I have the same content reflected at the same Bloom's level. So I'm trying to be consistent um, in that respect where I'm actually measuring, I'm actually trying to get data on what I said that I would get data on. Um, I don't think it's fair to the student to put a learning objective that says identify something and then uh, assess them at a level six on their assessment. Um, that, that would be kind of a bait and switch and I don't feel comfortable doing that with my students. So that's one of the ways that I ensure um, we have some validity within the um, exam that I'm writing or the quiz that I'm writing or even the homework assignment um, that I am doing. Um, if I have a higher level Bloom's question um, on that assessment, uh, say a level five or a level six that's clearly stated in their learning objectives, uh, then I match that with the content um, that, it's, that that objective is at as well. So there's a match on the content and a match on uh, the Bloom's level when I'm dealing with uh, validity.
um, if I were doing a little bit more intense uh, statistical analysis with my data, um, I might also look at item difficulties and you know make sure I have a spread of, of item difficulties within my assessment. But practically, when I'm writing those assessments on you know the busyness of the semester, um, those are my two quick checks to make sure that I'm assessing what I said I would assess. Well, reliability has to deal with consistency, um, and it's this idea that um, are my results actually reliable um, from an assessment? So one of the, the real quick uh, kind of basic ways I explain that is, are the students who are doing well in my class every day that are demonstrating you know, good scores on clicker responses, uh, stating that they understand the content when I'm asking them to explain it, are they the ones that are also doing well on the assessment? Is there consistency in their performance? If they're not, then my uh, instrument that I'm using to assess them is probably uh, faulty in some way because it's not actually reliable. It's not giving me a consistent result, um, and that means I need to look at those data. Uh, so what I do to do reliability uh, during the course of the semester is, first I will write up the assessment, and then I actually give it to one of my TAs to take. Um, I say, here, I need you to take this. Um, you know, they've been through my course. They did well in my course um, because they're a TA for me. And so if they can take that assessment, and they do well on the questions that I would expect them to do well on, and um, uh, that gives me a first line pass of reliability. If they don't, or if I get an answer that, whoa, I wasn't uh, expecting this response, it gives me a chance to go back and revise that before I give it to my students. Uh, there's no other way to pilot test items like you would on a large assessment uh, during the course of the semester, so, so that's how um, I kind of uh, take a first pass at that. And then when I get my data after the students take their exam, um, I actually put it into an Excel spreadsheet by student, and then each uh, question I put down the, the number of points that they earn. And then I run simple descriptive statistics on each item. I look at the mean, I look at the standard deviation, I look at the standard error, um, and I'm trying to look at the items. And then I flag the ones that have extremely high variation or uh, the ones where okay, my top students did not do well on this item, and that causes me to look at uh, the reliability of that uh, item, and it helps me to refine my assessment over time to make them become uh, more reliable thing I've done too that has helped me maybe more than any single thing if I'm using a multiple choice test for example mm -hmm. I allow students to put written arguments in on items that they missed yeah. and in fact I encourage them to do that mm -hmm. and then I tell them I do go through all of them I look to see if you have written arguments if they can make a good case for it and I'd say a third of the time they do yeah. I mean I give them credit for it yep. if they don't I tell them why that mm -hmm. kind of thing but it really helps me flag those items that, um, that I'm getting a lot of questions about, a lot right. of comments right. on. And that, for me, has been the single best way to, mm. to really get rid of my, I call them clunkers, you know, to get rid of the, the really poor questions. items. Yeah. But it also turns it into an educational experience for the student because yeah. they're having to go back. I encourage them to use your book, use your notes, whatever you want to make your argument. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be great. So it really takes their thinking a step deeper, but they also really appreciate kind of the fairness in the deal, yeah. and um, and they they really really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But I would say I do that I do it all the time. But the first time I give a test, I get a lot of comments on things, you mm -hmm. know, and then I go back and just revise most of them. So usually by the third time, the test is pretty solid, you yeah. know, in a sense too. Yeah. But it has a lot of benefits, not just helping me make a better test, but it really helps them in a lot of ways, too. Yeah, so that's yeah I've done that um, more so with because they're unfamiliar with taking a multiple choice assessment mm -hmm. right away. Uh, I will, the first go around, uh, we spend time actually revisiting the assessment as a whole. Mm -hmm. And they have an opportunity to say where their answer might have been incomplete or incorrect and, and why and then an uh, opportunity to correct it or enhance the question. I've done both of, of those, um, and that seems to help them. And then, of course, they want to do that in all of their assessments. Yep. Yep. Um, but <laughs> yep. it's a way to at least get them comfortable and familiar with a non-multiple choice uh, type of assessment at the beginning of the semester.
know, the best thing that I can share about assessment is um, have really clear, measurable learning objectives um, to start there, to have those clearly defined so that when you say, okay, it's test time, I need to write an assessment, you have a place to go. You have a blueprint for your assessment right there in front of you. Um, and by having them be measurable, not something like the student will understand, but something that's very, very concrete and measurable, the student will be able to calculate rate. Um, and the student will be able to graph uh, complex data using a logarithmic scale or something uh, along those lines. Those are measurable, and those are something that give you a way uh, to actually write your assessment. So start there. Um, really clearly establish those learning objectives. And then from there, uh, look at the Bloom's level really simple and easy to do just uh, bloom, I call it blooming just bloom those assessment or th those objectives assign each of them that bloom level and then you have an idea not only of the content but you have an idea of what kind of question you're going to ask them if it's a blooms level one Multiple choice might work excellently to assess that, and you could write a, a very great uh, knowledge level question, making sure that you're testing that learning objective um, with that question. If it's a level four application or uh, some sort of an analysis level, uh, then you're going to need to think outside of the box, potentially. Um, you could give students a data set and ask them to explain it, um, or something um, else along those lines. Maybe give them a novel case. Um, if we've been working with a particular organism in a particular habitat in class, I might switch up the organism and switch up the habitat and ask them to apply what they've learned in the class to a novel content um, area and a novel uh, habitat. Um, and so I'll, I'll tend to think uh, just a little bit outside of the box um, in terms of the questions that I could ask them. So those are kind of my, my big three, you know, establish your clear learning objectives, think about the blooms level of your assessment, and then think outside of the box. Um, assessment doesn't have to be paper pencil, assessment doesn't have to be multiple choice or fill in the blank or, uh, you know, matching. It can be more than that, um, and your students will maybe uh, be a little taken aback by that at the initial um, assessment opportunity, but they're going to grow along with you um, in that process of um, really trying to figure out the best way to measure your students' uh, understanding of those learning objectives.